the crowd is a lot bigger than what it was yesterday, and it's certainly bigger than what it was last year. So I have to congratulate uh, Patrick and the crew for putting up a really good show. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how he's going to top next year. I mean, having the Prime Minister as a guest is, is quite something. So, you know, maybe next year he'll bring Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or one of those guys. Uh, but anyway, uh, my discussion this morning is, is really kind of a continuation of a talk that I gave last year in, on the stage. And it's really about working with a telco, and I call it part two. Um, those of you who were here last year will remember that I said working with telcos, it's a real pain. I mean, telcos are generally very slow. Uh, they are somewhat arrogant. Uh, it is this very, it's a complete nightmare to work with them. Uh, the bad news is not much has changed. The good news is that, um, that to some degree, some telcos like ourselves have started m making some changes in such a way that we can actually work a lot better with you. And, and that's what I'm going to kind of share with you this morning. Uh, before we do that, I realize I don't have the clicker. Can I have it? Thank you. Thanks, Ranch. Um, so, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, this is kind of our boilerplate slide on the Axiata Group. Uh, it is one of the largest telco groups uh, in Southeast Asia, South Asia. We're based out of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I think the uh, MC mentioned that we have about 290 million subscribers. Uh, we operate in, across 10 different countries. It's actually quite an interesting mix because on the one hand, you have relatively mature markets like Singapore, uh, Malaysia, you know, smartphone penetrations there are very, very high. And on the other hand, you have frontier markets like uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, which is our newest addition, uh, Cambodia, right? So very interesting mix of different markets uh, where we have plenty of digital opportunities. Um, moving on to Axiata Digital, this is sort of who we are. Uh, we are a very active, uh, if you like, uh, venture builder across these five verticals, uh, ad tech, uh, uh, e-commerce, mobile money, uh, entertainment, uh, and then this fifth pillar called Disruptor Model, which I'll talk a little bit about in a short while. Uh, but some of the companies that you might know there, uh, Ad Knowledge, uh, in the, the first company in the ad tech space, um, they're going to speak later this, this afternoon. Uh, digital Commerce, uh, 11 year, uh, James, the CEO, is here. He'll be sharing some insights with the group later today. It's a, a very large uh, B2C e-commerce player in Indonesia. Um, Yonder, under digital entertainment, uh, Adam, the CEO, spoke this, uh, yesterday uh, and shared how he's been working with the telcos in actually getting his, his product out there. Um, and then the disruptor models where essentially the belief is that as a telco, we understand that the business model that we have today will be all but gone in about five to ten years' time. And so we're looking at different models that actually will, to some extent, replace the model that we have or augment the model that we have. So we made a couple of investments. Freedom Pop is a U.S.-based company. It's based out of L.A. Uh, they are a freemium communication service provider. It's now launched in the U.S., U.K., uh, soon to be Spain, uh, Italy, and Mexico. Uh, and we're probably going to bring them out to our markets here. Uh, and then the last one is the horizontal, uh, the Digital Enablement and Innovation Fund. Uh, we have MIFE, I'll just pick on two, MIFE, which I'll talk about uh, in a short while. Uh, MIFE, it's a mouthful, it stands for Mobile Internet Fulfillment Exchange. Um, we've always joked around, and I know I told this joke last year, but we were very close to calling it Wireless Internet Fulfillment Exchange, but someone had the great hindsight to sort of say, you know, we don't want to be working with our wife all the time. Um, ADIF, that's our uh, digital innovation fund. In fact, let me just gonna flip to the next slide. Uh, these are some of the companies that we've invested in ADIF. Uh, so it is managed by a third party, uh, L, sorry, GP. Uh, so some of the companies that you might know, KFIT, Joel Neal, who spoke yesterday morning, uh, we put some money into his company. Uh, Easy Uni, uh, Made Easy, uh, Spot News, which is a uh, news portal out of Singapore. So some of the companies that we've invested through our fund. So that's a little bit of who we are. Um, at, the, at the core of it, what we're trying to do is simply down to these two things, right? One is that we want to be able to participate in digital companies or OTT adjacencies that will enhance our core business revenue. Uh, last year, if you were here, I showed some very interesting data around how having you know, an entertainment uh, offering or having a wallet offering actually helps us increase our ARPUs, right? I, I showed some data that showed that if you have an entertainment, a video service, perhaps like iFlix, uh, attached to it, we, we do see our ARPUs uplifted by up 24%, 25%. Uh, and if you have a great wallet product, your churn actually can be significantly reduced. We showed some data last year uh, in our markets in, in, say, Bangladesh, where churn basically went down by about 90% when we have active usage of our wallet. So 
pillar number one was all about really getting into these businesses that allow us to uh, drive our core business revenues up. And, and, you know, we are still a very large telco, so anything that you can do to kind of raise the revenues actually does have a material impact on our enterprise value. But the second one, and, and the graphic kind of tells it all, right, we are effectively, as a telco, we're sitting on oil, right, you know, right underneath the land that we harvest uh, for ARPUs and for churn and whatnot is, is actually oil. We're sitting on all sorts of assets, and, and so one of the objectives of our unit is to basically expose those assets uh, to companies like yours, uh, and in partnership, hopefully, kind of create new sources of value, right, together with you. Now, notice I didn't say revenue, I said value, uh, and that's what we're kind of gunning for. So that's, that's two. Now, at the end of last year's conference, a lot of people came up to me and said, like, what exactly do you guys do? So, well, the way we achieve these two objectives is around kind of these three things. Number one, we're actually an incubator. So there are a number of the portfolio companies that you saw before that we've internally incubated. Uh, we grew them to scale, and then we launched them, right? And actually, there are also a large number of those that we incubated, we realized it's not going to go anywhere, and we shut them down. Uh, so, in fact, there were some businesses in, the, in, in last year's slide that's not actually not on this year's slide, because we, uh, in the course of last year, we actually shut down four businesses, right, like any normal incubator would do. Uh, so we've done it internally, and, and sometimes we actually work with partners. So if you think about our e-commerce business, 11 year, um, we partnered with uh, SK Planet from Korea. Uh, they've actually successfully built e-commerce businesses uh, in uh, Korea, in Turkey, uh, their footprints in the U.S. US, and so we found them to be a great partner, and we worked with them uh, to actually build our business in Indonesia. So, so number one is really kind of the classic sort of business incubator, business builder um, um, function, if you like. The second is that we're an enabler, and, and what I mean by that is we find ways to get your business, your concepts, uh, to work with the telcos. Now, I started this presentation by saying that it's actually very difficult to work with the telcos. Uh, Adam, who's sitting right in front of us, uh, he's the CEO of Yonder, and he will tell you all the pains that he had to go through. So one of the roles that we play within Axiata Digital is to help connect you to the operations that we have. Uh, help you create those heart bundles together with the opcos, right? You know, maybe an iFlix heart bundle, a Yonder heart bundle. That's some of the things that we do. But the other thing that we have, which for those of you who attended the Axiata Digital Workshop yesterday, you would have been introduced to MIFE and what we do within MIFE. Now, I've got a couple of slides on MIFE, which I'll, I'll go into in a second. But essentially, it is an API gateway that allows you to connect uh, to the assets that we have. And then the third one is we are an investor, right? We are, if you like, almost like a corporate uh, VC. Uh, we are looking for businesses uh, that will help capture the value that we have as, as, a, as a telco, right? So we're not very good at unlocking those, uh, th those assets, and we actually sometimes count on you guys. Uh, and so we will be looking to invest in some of you guys to then actually unlock the assets that we have. Um, you know, telcos, by and large, we know how to build networks, we know how to sell data, SMS voice, right? And that's kind of our core bread and butter. But we will be looking for companies to kind of build upon. A um, couple of examples here. Uh, you, you saw Adif, which, uh, you know, it is actually an investment arm. Uh, I want to point out Storking because unlike the other businesses that we've invested in that basically is trying to capture the customer access that we have, Storking is actually trying to leverage the distribution footprint that we have. It is a company based out of India. Uh, they are in the assisted commerce model. Uh, they are providing services to the likes of Snapdeal, Flipkart, Amazon in India. Very, very amazing model. Uh, we just closed a deal with them a couple of months ago. So that's who we are and what we do. Um, let me now move to... Um, MIFE, um, very excited by this company. Um, it is essentially an API gateway to access the operator system. In fact, let me just kind of blow this up. So essentially what it is, is if you think about yourself as kind of the blue dots up there, uh, this is a one-stop shop to allow yourselves to connect to all the assets that we have, right? And, and it, it's connected through APIs. Um, I'm sure you guys know what that is. Uh, so far, the APIs that we've exposed, uh, messaging, carrier billing, uh, LBS and authentication um, allow you to kind of just do simple things like actually bill for the products that you sell. Uh, I think we heard yesterday that actually in our markets, uh, credit card penetration is extremely low. 
So, you know, telcos actually provide a way for you to extract dollar from it um, through our carrier billing product. Uh, the bit on the right-hand side, those are APIs that are only available in some markets right now, not in all markets, and that will include also accessing a mobile wallet, right? So in many of our markets, we actually do have customers with, uh, who have registered with a mobile wallet product, and you can actually draw, if you're buying, say, a, an app on Google Play, uh, you can actually pay with your, your mobile wallet, right? And so some of those uh, are there. Uh, and we have a pipeline of different APIs that we're slowly going to expose, right? In fact, uh, just for your reference, uh, we've actually internally exposed something like 300 different APIs internally. We're just looking at to how to commercialize each one of those 300 uh, such that we actually get a broader base of, of uh, customers and audience, right? Uh, oh, and some highlights there. Uh, this is actually a relatively new business for us. We launched it in August of uh, 2015. Um, and uh, to date, we have about 27 internet businesses live or being connected. Uh, 69 titles or apps that are live on my... Uh, and that doesn't include the one million or so mobile publishers on Google Play or uh, the Apple App Store uh, that's also connected. <clears throat> so that's MIFE. Um, now I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about us as an investor. And it's quite interesting that this topic has not come up in this conference yet. Uh, and this, this is the topic of the slight, well, call it if you want, correction that's happening uh, in our space today, right? And uh, this chart here basically shows the pace of unicorn creation all the way from 2011 uh, to, to today, right? And you'll see that it actually sort of peaked around, I guess, sort of mid-2015. And the pace of unicorn cr creation has actually slowed down dramatically. If, in fact, if you go into the WSJ unicorn tracker, it's basically held flat at about 146 unicorns for the last few months now, right? So it's actually a little bit of a worrying sign. Um, if you look at uh, the, I guess, financing landscape, the funding landscape, very, the blue bars are basically the investments in terms of dollars. Uh, the blue line is the number of deals. And you'll see, again, it peaked around Q3, and it started dropping in Q4. Q4, Q1, it's been the lowest, right? Now, I know that the, the, our friends from Jungle Ventures mentioned yesterday that actually, in a sense, Southeast Asia is a little bit kind of uh, protected from it. There's still some uptrends in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are a global investor. We look at investments across the globe, and so we look at this picture more than just the Southeast Asian picture. Uh, by the way, this picture is also relatively similar in India. India is also facing a little bit of a crunch uh, in terms of investment dollars. So it is kind of a very interesting time right now. Sorry, is that my phone? No. Um, and then if you look at companies that are being tracked, this is, uh, if you go into something called the WSJ Startup Stock Tracker, they basically track all the uh, uh, private assets that are publicly held, sorry, are held in public mutual funds, right? So this would be specifically T. Rowe, uh, Fidelity. Uh, and so there are about, I don't know, about 40 or so companies here. And what's quite interesting is that two-thirds of them have been written down uh, in the last quarter or so. Right, so if you look at it, some very uh, interesting names, I think everyone's heard of Zenefits and the debacle that happened there, uh, Jawbone, Dropbox, those are all the companies that have been written down by T-Row or written down by Fidelity. Of course, on the opposite side, you've got a handful of companies that are still seem to be creating value and, and beating the trend here. What does that mean for all of you out here? Well, for us, it actually then goes back to kind of the core of what we do as an investor. We track our portfolio companies um, down to uh, what was described by the gentleman from, uh, from Sequoia yesterday, down to the unit economics level, right? So let me give you an example. So this is uh, for one of our portfolio of businesses. It's actually quite disguised, so you don't know what it is. It's completely redacted, so you can't read any of the numbers there uh, for obvious reasons. But we track things like that, right? So we, we're looking at, for instance, the lifetime value of the customers that we're acquiring versus the cost of actually acquiring the customer. And what it does give us an insight to is actually the path to profitability of these assets that we're acquiring, right? So we're fine spending tons and tons and tons of money on marketing so long as at the unit level, it's actually showing positive unit economics, right? So, uh, you know, our e-commerce business, our, you know, music streaming business, we spend tons of money, uh, millions of dollars to acquire customers, um, and we'll continue to do that so long as at the unit level, we're getting good traction on a lifetime value uh, versus the uh, cost of acquisition. And if you look then, what we then translates to is we then have, you know, kind of charts like that, that basically say, well, you know, when do we see a path to profitability in some of these assets that we have? And then we translate that to, oops, sorry. Can you go back one slide? 
Okay, and then we translate to very fixed management levers that we as a management team will then work with our portfolio assets to kind of figure out what to do, right? So what does that mean for you guys? I guess what, what I'm trying to say here is that so long as you have a great business idea, um, make sure that you are also focused on your unit economics because your unit economics is the one that will get us excited about investing in you. We, with the deep pockets, will fund you and fund your acquisition growth, fund your scaling up. Um, and we will support you with providing you a lot of assets like the ones that we showed on MIFE. Um, and that will then help you uh, basically grow your base such that we can then get into sort of the positive zone within this chart, right? Now, final point. Um, so implications for today. Uh, there is a funding crunch right now. Um, less so in Southeast Asia, a lot in South Asia, definitely in the global scene. Uh, there is a fight for capital uh, from limited sources right now. We are, of course, one of the sources. Uh, there's also a contraction of valuations, uh, reassessment down to the underlying fundamentals. Uh, what does that mean for you guys? Well, for you guys, hopefully it's good news. Uh, we are going shopping. Uh, we think that this correction is actually very good for companies like ours with deep pockets. Uh, we will be coming to you. We will be looking at you as potential investments. Uh, and with 20 seconds to go, oh, time is up. Sorry, I've actually overran by 30 seconds. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.